Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Vina, host of the Smart Tech Check podcast. Today is Friday, August 11th, 2023. Marketing in 2023 is adopting an increasingly outsourced model, leveraging specialized agencies and freelancers. This shift optimizes costs and time, while stringent collaboration ensures messaging and content quality. Companies balance in-house expertise with external insights, maintaining broad coherence while tapping into diverse skills. This approach enhances efficiency without compromising creative excellence. To discuss this evolving role of the marketing function in 2023, I'm joined by Brian Wallace, founder of Now Sourcing. Brian, how are you? Great. How are you? How's your morning going? I'm really excited to talk to you today. We're going to go about 20 or 25 minutes to talk about what you do. Um, it's interesting that every once in a while I come across a person that is doing something really interesting that's kind of tangential uh, to the to the uh, technology coverage function, which my company is based yeah. on. And since I've managed big marketing organizations at, com- at big, big companies throughout the course of my career, I said, hey, this would be a delightful person to be on a podcast and talk about what they do because you're truly doing some innovative stuff. And uh, the marketing function is evolving like every other function at, at companies. So what I'd like to do is let me bring up a, a bit about your background so you can talk cool. about yourself and then we'll go into a few uh, topics here. Wonderful. Thanks. So go ahead. Go for it. No, no, I, no, 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 it's you. It's, it's a, uh, talk about your, your background. Sure. So once upon a time, I was a technologist and did that for the better part of a decade. And I found that a lot of people really don't care how the technology works. They want it to work, and they're going to be very upset when it doesn't work. So I thought technology, innovation, it's all wonderful, but the promise of the technology is really what it's about. And communicating that promise and the rubber meets the road deliverables was what I was much more comfortable with. So over time, and I like to think that I like to talk, people like my energy or the way I talk it about it. I've had people say they like the sound of my voice, which is not the creepiest thing that people could say about you on the internet. But I've heard, <laughs> I just, I have like this, uh, just all wrapped up in a bottle sort of thing, unique insights that being more of a communicator and a marketer, understanding how all of that technology works, I feel like is a really good bundling superset of skills that I can deliver to the world. Well, you know, what's interesting about that before you get into it, um, we, we get into what your company does. The thing that's intriguing to me, and I absolutely agree with you. And I mean, for, I, I want to say for the first, from the 60s, the 70s and 80s, even throughout the 90s, yeah. a lot of the consumer, a lot of the tech companies out there um, really focused on feeds and speeds. You know, they, they were, mm-hmm. again, let's face it, most engineering companies, most technology companies are started by engineers. They're not classic marketeers. They don't understand right. that sometimes, you know, you're communicating to an audience where you have to really break down with the value propositions. They immediately right. go, the house, they, uh, A is faster than B and B was faster than C. Yeah. And they think it's going to win the day. And I think really, oh, and really, you got to give a lot of credit to Apple because I think Jobs was very much focused on that, trying to democratize computing. When I was with Compaq, I was, I'm going to date myself, I was one of the original product managers on the Presario brand, the first consumer brand. I remember of that. PCs. Well, and what, you know, kids don't remember it today, but there was a time not too long ago. Hey, kids are missing out. Compaq ran the world when it came to that stuff. So kudos to yeah, you, man. Well, That's and, great. And the, and the challenge was, is that you went out and bought a beige PC and, and the, the, there was hmm. this general belief that, well there really is no such thing as a consumer customer for a P for a PC. And that could completely, would really prove to be fat, uh, fat, um, to uh, be uh, completely false and yeah. out in the compact Presario brand. But let's go into a little bit about, um, you know, some of the things I want to talk about today in that first of mm-hmm. all, you describe yourself as an infographic design agency. Sure. Let's talk about it. And how does it help your clients? Yeah. So I think, Let's set the record straight when it comes to what an infographic is, because a lot of people, when they hear infographic design agency, they think I need to just be put away in a mental institution or something. It's like, don't you know that there's Canva and templates and artificial intelligence? Why would we never need that? And I'd say, okay, go ahead, try doing it yourself. And then six months later, when you're beating your head against the wall and you make something that you're ashamed to show, or you know it's not going to get any media pickup, now we have a conversation. If you imagine the visuals that we see, I'm sure you see this recurring visual all the time of the iceberg. So what is an iceberg, right? This little bit that's sticking up above the water 
and everything else in the depths below, there's so much more to the iceberg, right? As is the infographic, as is the broader abstract roll-up of all of what we do, which I would say uh, neatly falls under the realm of content marketing. So sometimes we say we're a content marketing agency, but again, to set that record straight in the nuance of what an infographic is, what we've developed over the last 17 years of operation, and of those, probably a good 15 of those, for infographics and what they serve, we look at it by saying we help make the world's ideas better by making them simple, visual, and influential. So simplicity is really what this world needs. Mark and I have been talking about tech a lot. And the problem with a lot of tech is it's really overconfident, beating its chest if you're watching me on video, where we're so confident in our little acronyms and little weird worlds of lexicons of knowledge that the regular humans don't understand. And I'm not saying that other people are dumb. I'm saying that they're not used to all of this terminology. So I remember we did a project all about Wi-Fi 6 and 802.11 AX standards and IEEE protocols and a bunch of stuff that Mark and I can talk about for hours. But people don't really care about that. They just want to know that Wi-Fi is going to go great and you can do multiple devices at once. So Yeah, and, and let me jump in right there. You said the magic phrase. Wi-Fi 6 is a great example of that because totally. the fact of the matter is, is that you know, some customers, many customers, the majority of uh, uh, customers out there who consume Wi-Fi, you know, they're just they're enthralled with having basic connectivity. When yes. you start getting to this alphabet soup of, well, it was Wi-Fi 4, then Wi-Fi 6, now you got Wi-Fi 6E, Wi-Fi 7, by the way, is right around the corner. Sure and yep. what, what I think is a big fail with technology companies is that they think that the bigger number because that's the way it kind of worked during the uh, the 80s and 90s. Yeah, now, totally. Intel did this very famous with, with Pentium. Pentium mm -hmm. XYZ is a bigger number than Pentium, the previous Pent uh, Pentium iteration, so it's got to be better. Well, right. guess what? You know, uh, Wi-Fi is a much more different type of animal, and I just don't believe many consumers understand the differences between Wi-Fi, uh, Wi-Fi 5, Wi-Fi 6. And, just and they don't have to. Them. Right. right. It's how you explain it. We're actually doing uh, some projects right now that I can't talk about yet, but uh, one of the world's and nation's largest internet providers, let's just say that, is tapping us to explain these very kinds of concepts. And what I said to them, what I'll say to you, what I'm saying about Wi-Fi 6, it's how does the practical application of humanity and their needs and device across devices manifest in this technology? Right. Stop your nomenclature, stop your network topology, stop explaining standards. So when you look at it, imagine like many of us drive, right? Many of us have been on a highway, maybe even today. So Wi-Fi 6 is almost like having multiple on-ramps to get on the highway instead of everything waiting in line. Wouldn't you rather hear that in five seconds and get it? Or do you want to talk about tech babble all day? It doesn't make any sense to me. So that's right. why I'm saying simplicity rewards your end customer and the media. Over explaining it only makes you feel your feel good and pat yourself on the back. <laughs> pat yourself on the back, which happens at a lot of uh, tech companies. Yeah, listen, you, I mean, ego is a very real thing, but it doesn't help your bottom line. Now, have you found when you have this very candid conversation with a with a potential client, someone who hasn't signed up yet, but someone who's reached out to you, do you find pushback saying, you know, well, yeah, but you know what, we still have a we're still better than the competition and we've got to really focus on numbers and metrics and, and, and yeah, the usage models are important, but at the end of the day, we need to demonstrate our superiority from a technology standpoint. So do you get a lot of that pushback sometimes? Depends on the client, depends on what their message is. But here's what I say to people, regardless of how much they're resistant to that message. Instead of making it all salesy and heavy handed about you, if you could better explain the industry better than everybody explains the industry, you win because you get an overshare of that pie. In addition to that, very often, and this blows my mind when I think about it, the total addressable market for a market often pales in comparison to a larger spread of the market that would be into the market but never thought about it. Something yeah. that I don't know why this always comes to mind for me, but I go to a chiropractor pretty regularly. And I'd say more than half of the population thinks that a chiropractor is a quack, is going to hurt you, not real science, whatever. So you've got a bunch of doubters. And let's just say it's roughly 50 to 75% of everybody that they could market to. So what's going to work better? You, the chiropractor, with your bullet points about how great you are and how nice your office is and how they're going to crack your back, blah, blah, blah. 
They're not gonna they're not gonna injure you. Like what what are they gonna say? So you can either brag about yourself, you could talk about physician nonsense, which doesn't help anybody, or you could nuance into the benefits of how it helps the people you're helping and speak to them instead of over their head. People don't want to feel stupid. They want to be listened to. They want to see themselves in it, right? Plain and simple. But if you could illustrate something that would explain the market, but what if you could go above that? What if you could say, hey, people, and of course you're not going to write this exactly chapter and verse, but what if you said, hey, people that doubt this, this is a real thing. If you could convince and grow the total addressable market, imagine how much you'd win. It's insane. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's an interesting point because there's a lot of interesting, you know, I, I, I focus on all different types of tech products, totally. but consumer most of my heart because that's kind of where I began in my in the beginning of my that. technology career. Yeah. But there's a lot of technologies, especially ingredient technologies that maybe in, have intent that, you know, that it was viewed as, oh, well, the tech, we know this technology can address this market, but hey, by the way, if it's applied in a different usage model, it might appeal to a much larger market or a different market. You know, right. So that, that, yeah. that gets me. That's an interesting point. That's a very, very interesting point. Thanks. Again, no, it's no, all about simplicity. simplicity. But if you heard what I said, I said simple, visual and influential. So people do not read on the Internet. And again, I'm not picking on people. I'm saying that your brain lights up differently when you're scanning over stuff on the Internet. You noticed I use the word scanning to right. say it properly. There's a process called chunking. I'm pretty sure Jacob Nielsen, like 30 something years ago, said this first. He's like a famous guy in usability yes. studies. So Jacob and everybody on down says that your mind, your brain, your eyeballs are scanning all over the page, looking for visuals, looking for separators, looking for what do I focus on? Yes. Right. And I'm not calling you ADHD or something. I'm just saying this is what your brain does, period. So why not serve that by making things simple and visual? And then, of course, the influential, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute. How do you get that out there, that it isn't just a piece of sales or marketing or advertising collateral, but it actually gets the attention of media and editorials and blogs and influencers? And that makes a big difference. That's oh, the yeah, key. Oh, absolutely. And that was that's a phenomenon that, that did not exist 10 years ago, let alone, let alone you know, 20 years ago. That's right. a very, very um, interesting point. And by the way, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about this, yeah. is that you know, and the smartphone has driven this. Everybody has a, a, a short attention span. You know, if you don't grab someone in 10 or 12 seconds, you know, I, you, you lose the buy. No, no. I, I think there's an important point there. So different marketers say uh, you have 2.7 seconds or you lose the person. Or people have the average attention span of a goldfish, eight seconds. I've heard nine seconds, 12 seconds. So we say, so you're not wrong, but there are two things that are right in this sphere. One thing is we have developed a crap filter because there's such a proliferation of data to the point that it is a landfill of data. We produce more every year than like all of human history, right? Or some crazy stat like that. So when everything is thrown at us, man, you can't even go to the gas station without the pump screaming at you with screens. You go in an elevator and then just scream everywhere you go. You know, Google's probably working on, you know, infiltrating your dreams or something right now. If you're listening, Google, please don't do that. We need a break from all this tech stuff. Anyway, it's insane how much data we see. It's mind numbing, literally. So we've developed a reaction to that, which is so-called short attention span. But my fight back, my pushback to marketers that say these things is how does Netflix roll out Series X, Movie Y, Amazon Prime, whatever, and then people will binge watch it in a weekend. So we have so cognitive dissonance, right? Do we have eight second attention spans or five hour straight attention spans? So the, the mind trick, it's not a trick, it's carefully calculated, but what a, an infographic when designed correctly or any kind of content or messaging does when done correctly, it gets in that short pattern buffer, whether it's two, three, five, 10, 12 seconds, whatever, short amount of time, it opens your mind to allow permission for the marketer for more permission of your mind to serve you more content. And yes. that's the key. No, I agree. I agree with that. Um, so let's talk a little bit of how the marketing function has changed over the past uh, couple of decades. Um, you know, in my, in my day, which wasn't that long ago, you know, you, you're you, still, 
<laughs> Somewhat kid at heart. The yeah. marketing functions typically were very much in-house. You did everything in-house from graphics illustration. I mean, mm. you might occasionally have some outsourced um, folks that you might bring in for some from for some specialization. A lot right. of video work. A lot of even large corporations at that time, you know, would go to an agency. Hey, I need a five-minute video, or I need a six-minute animation, and we'll sit down with you and we'll help you storyboard it out. But the reality is now the world has changed completely. You've got Fiverr out there. You've got um, really, very, very talented, you know, outsourced agencies with tremendous grade A talent. You don't comp compromise on the talent. Right. The thing that I want to ask you, because you're going to talk about this, I think, in a, in a bit of detail, is yeah. the one thing that I'm sure uh, corporations or whether even if they're not big companies, small, medium businesses, because you probably have a, a lot of smaller clients as well is how do you guarantee continuity? Because a good agency, when we when I would work with an agency, was, hey, Mark, you know, you're know, you going to be working with a team of people that over the course of two or three years, they'll get you, they'll understand your value proposition. You don't have to re-educate them every time you take on a new project. Because that whole one-off thing scares marketing teams because you, you don't know what stable of people you might be working with over a period of time. So in that context, talk about how the marketing function has changed. Man, there's so many directions we could go with this. Take a swing. Let's, go a few, let's go a few different directions with this. Let's start with something that I like to talk about. So many of you have heard of Reid Hoffman, one of the brilliant people behind LinkedIn. And if you've ever looked at the way Reid Hoffman approaches work and interaction between people within a team, he actually borrows a military term called a tour of duty. So instead of everybody just being sloppy and lazy and on repeat, we just... Eh, we just go along for a year, two years, five years. It's a lot more honest. So I actually detest a lot of the way advertising and marketing firms do these ironclad draconian retainers where you lock somebody in for a year, two years, five years. How do I know that I, the service provider, want to work with you, the company? Maybe you're miserable to work with, right? I don't think there's a worse places to work award, but you know, if there was, there should be some places that are eligible. So I think that we need some honest level of accountability on why we're here and what targets we're trying to serve. So a lot of these gigantic agencies of record or places that they're full service marketing A to Z, a lot of that world is not the same as it used to be. A lot of the way that we work is fragmented right? Remote work came in all of a sudden because of COVID, but did it? Like how long is, it used to be called telecommuting back when you and I were getting our starts, in, <laughs> right? So we all would scream from the rooftops, we should telecommute, why can't you? And we bring all these studies and management wouldn't listen, but now COVID comes and remote work is cool because now we don't have to afford gigantic corporate leases. Wouldn't you know it? I guess we can do a lot of work remotely. So that's opened the door to a lot of the world's experts, such as the kinds of stuff that we do. So why would you, as a giant company or a small company, hire somebody that's mediocre at a bunch of stuff? What, because you like to pay one invoice and get garbage work? I mean, okay. But you have choices in this world in a free market, and you should take advantage of them. So we actually like to work piecemeal, at least at the start with places, until we have a good comfort level of working together. So I think that when you look at how marketing functions like that, it's a better way to look at things. So not to just be focused campaign by campaign or quarter by quarter, but to just think about how to be intentional in your marketing from one thing to the next, because when you don't, everything atrophies on the client side where everything's on repeat and on the service provider side where maybe you take your foot off the gas a little and you're just used to billing. That's lazy. I don't know about you, but I actually like to work hard. You know, <laughs> maybe I'm insane. I don't know, but I think that there's nothing wrong with working hard and delivering great results. Right. Yeah. No, I agree with that. <laughs> of course, 100. percent I think that the the thing that's interesting to me is that whole continuity message, and mm -hmm. that you don't have to do. You know, the 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 advantage of having a marketing function completely in house, completely staffed in every discipline, which is very expensive. Hard to do, right? You know, and, and and practical today for a whole variety of different reasons. That right. you can now have, you, you know, utilize companies like yours, still have that continuity that so is so important and, and is so valuable. And by the way, you know, let's face it, the the, the 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 people I'm sure that you have that you're using in your teams, these are people who are not, you know, um, the the C team. I mean, you're you've got people that would rival 
worked Correct. with any of the top Correct. flight um, marketing companies. And yeah, by the way, the biggest brands in the world. So if we could do that yes. for them, I'm sure we could do it for anybody. Right. Absolutely. Ab 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 absolutely. Mm -hmm. So the last thing is that let's, from a marketing standpoint, what do you see in the biggest trends that you're seeing? Obviously, AI is a big deal. You know, I want to say, I want to get your thoughts on how AI is kind of impacting things. Um, well, well, actually, let's start with that because AI to me is very interesting because there's all this fear how AI is, you know, forcing people to lose their jobs. You've got the, the Screen Actors Guild on strike right now because they're afraid that, a, that AI is going to, you know, start writing scripts uh, for screenplays, which, by yeah. the way, there, there's probably some truth behind that. And that becomes a residual um, discussion. But yeah. specific to, you know, the, 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 the activities that you engage in, what are the biggest trends that you're seeing right now? Yeah, so, you know, I'm not a doom and gloom guy, and I, I'm also not just like a an automatic AI fanboy like some people. So the problem with a lot of AI is you've got a lot of charlatans and morons that come in, and a few years ago, they were a crypto expert and an ICO expert, and then they were a VR expert, and then they were an NFT expert. So for a lot of people, now they're like a ChatGPT prompt expert selling $100 courses. And they're pretending to be experts. It's like, well, how did you build it? Like, how long could you possibly be an expert? So I think um, there's a lot of fraud baked into the market because it's overvalued like crazy. Like yes. OpenAI burns like, what, $20 million a day or something? And it's starting to have a downtick. Um, there's no doubt that AI will transform the way we work. But to blindly say AI is going to throw people out is insanity. Here's what I think. If you look at a normal bell curve, where it's short, huge, down, right? I think that the lower quadrant, right? The, the first half of the curve of people making garbage content, or maybe English isn't your first language and you're trying to generate a blog post or a decent piece of an image or a photo or something, it will eliminate the bottom quartile or half of garbage. But won't it just generate a lot of sameness? And whose IP is it? Yes. Like, why would you blindly put private company information? Um, I saw a friend of mine on Facebook. I think she played with one of these Facebook apps and some dating site like basically stole her likeness, changed it with AI, and they're using it for all these like single mom dating ads and she's trying to like sue the company or something. It's very black mirror. I don't think people understand how to cite it, how to source it, how to use it. It's good for automation, but nothing is new under the sun. Like AI is not new. AI was coined as a phrase in 1953. We've right. done AI projects for companies in the AI space for at least six, seven, eight years. So it's not, not the first day that I'm looking at this stuff. But it makes a lot of the, the grunt work easier, but to just blindly follow AI is a, a foolish errand. No, I, I, I agree with it 100 percent. I mean, my, I think the point you're making, especially when it comes to the creative side, I don't believe maybe it will happen one day. I, I haven't seen it yet. I don't think AI has a creative element to it in regards to some of the best creative content, whether it's a commercial, whether right. it's a movie, right. whether it's an, an infographic is when right. the human brain comes at something from a completely different angle than an algorithm could produce for AI. I think of, you know, I won't bore you with this, but there's a number of movies um, sure. and, I'm, and I'm a big fan, theater, a fan of the theater where yeah. someone said, hey, this book was impossible to write a musical about or write a play because the book was too long. But the author came at it at a completely different non-linear right. angle and it was a a a, um, a complete epiphany um mm -hmm. and it became a, something became a big hit i guess my men of la mancha comes along by the way i could talk about that forever but exactly. i mean That's you could right. argue very strongly that ai could never write a uh, a, a musical based on something simply because it it, 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 it can't have an appreciation for coming at things Correct. from a different angle. And I could apply that up to a variety of different things. Now, now, AI is great from a regurgitation standpoint. You know, it's great from a, which does have some advantages in some areas. But when you're looking at doing compelling content, I think it's real hard. AI struggles. 
you know, so I, I agree with you, but let's say we want to be somewhat not horribly negative about all AI. No, I'm not negative about it. I think there's something that I don't think people give enough thought about. So in all of the content that you see about AI in the discussions, we have conversations about how it's going to save time, how it's going to get rid of jobs, ethical considerations. Um, creepy artificial general intelligence, which we'll, maybe we'll just save for another day because that's going to be a little scary when it actually knows yeah. how to think. And we're not there yet. Don't worry, everybody. We're not taken over by the AI overlords. But in case you're listening, guys, you know, I do love you. So here's the thing. Artificial, artificial intelligence. I didn't just stutter, but artificial, artificial intelligence. The human ability to think, to guide the AI, to make better decisions, if we can call them decisions, is actually how it can do some of the things that you're saying. So it's all in the nuance of how you teach it to adapt. And that's something that should be explored further by humanity. As it's, I think it's getting there, but we're not oh, there there's, there's no question about that. Like for example, in, in, in the medical sphere, and mm -hmm. uh, I just, there was a study out the other day around um, breast cancer and uh, it basically, uh, the study, I, I think it was in the New England Journal of Medicine, but I could be wrong. Okay. But yeah. basically the study said that using AI technology help detect cancer um, um, occurrence in, in, a, in, a, in a pool of um, patients yeah, I remember that. at a 20% yeah. higher rate than a human could, you know, than a, do right. than a doctor could on the same patients. That's a good thing, you know, right. but I don't think you want to have AI in, even in a medical app, uh, in a medical um, uh, uh, dynamic. I don't think you want to see, uh, you don't want an AI become your doctor. You know, you need right. to have that human involvement right. as well. Yeah. In the couple of minutes we have left, uh, Brian, talk to us a little bit of how your agency, how they can reach you, how they can come um, uh, engage with you. You know, what what is your best? What just give me maybe the, the way to answer that question? How would you define your best clients that you typically engage with from an, from a um, a work working relationship standpoint? Maybe you could describe that a bit. Yeah, that's fair. So my best client isn't a particular industry. It's not a particular market. It's not even a particular size. I mean, we don't work for free, but aside from that, we work with small businesses. We work with very large businesses that have existed for a couple hundred years. We work with all sorts of startups and all of that. Um, I think our best client is if you want a yes man, no, like we're never going to do that. <laughs> If you just want somebody to, you know, push around like an internet magic marker, go on Fiverr or something like that. Um, we are going to be very vociferous and note our opinions because we have a pretty good pulse for what the internet wants. We've done a lot of at bats with this kind of thing. And it's not that we have all the ideas in the world, but when you bring somebody to the table with a lot of expertise, maybe instead of just paying them money to shut them up, you like actually listen to them. Like, don't do my job for me. If you're big tech, I don't tell you how to do your thing either. And you don't have time to do my thing. So I think people that are open to looking at something from a very different matter and standpoint, because we within organizations get very trapped in the safe bets, the minutia, the inside the four walls, the yes. political politics of the case and the infrastructure and the organization, the official org chart, the unofficial org chart, right? We all get obsessed with that. How do I make my boss happy? Whereas we can come in and say, listen, I know that you love this point, but the whole world does not find this relevant ever. And sometimes when we get our clients talking, they'll just say something in passing. They'll be like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, do you realize like what a treasure chest that is? Meanwhile, you take that treasure chest and you just like put a tablecloth on it and you eat your lunch. People do not understand how the world perceives them and their industries. And I think when we can take all of the lateral thinking that we've learned across industries over the decade and a half plus that we've been around, plus the decade of me and technology, and then triangulate all sorts of thoughts and patterns and cross pollinate that with media and what the internet wants, that's a really good fit. So a lot of folks come to us through inbound marketing, referrals, word of mouth, virality. They see us, you know, they see pieces that we've done that have continued to live on the internet for 10, 15 years after they're out there. I get weird calls by like three other agencies that want to use it for training. Like some of the conversations I have, like I, I got to write a book one day about like how weird some of it is, honestly. So I feel like a lot of people, they, they come to us, right? They see something about their nuanced industry and they already see some of the work or it's recommended or organic search. I speak a fair amount on stages and podcasts like this fine podcast with Mark here. And we're at now sourcing on all the socials. LinkedIn's my jam. I'm not going to lie. I feel like a lot of other socials are 
not really geared for business. And then of course, at now. Well, Brian, listen, thank you very much for joining me for today's podcast. It was a very informative discussion for our viewing and listening audience. Thanks for making the smart tech check podcast, part of your day or commute. Please make sure that you hit the like and subscribe buttons at the end of today's podcast or use these on-screen QR codes to connect with me. You can also follow me on Twitter at Mark Vina Tech Guide. And until next time, have a great week. And uh, Ryan, thanks again. Pleasure, Mark. Thank you so much.